started. So hello and thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to the first Richard M. Carp Distinguished Lecture this semester. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Uh, we established this RM Carp series to celebrate the uh, pioneering role in theoretical computer science of uh, Simons Institute founding director Dick Carp. Uh, and we're grateful to the many contributors to the Richard M. Carp Fund for their support of the series. The series features visionary leaders in the field of theoretical computer science on topics associated with current programs that are running at the Institute. Uh, and it's geared towards a broad scientific audience. So this semester, the Simons Institute's hosting two uh, entirely online programs, not quite entirely, there's a small um, in-person component. Um, one's on the theoretical foundations of computer systems and one's on satisfiability theory practice and beyond. And I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, uh, Orna Grunberg, who's a participant in the program on theoretical foundations of computer systems. Orna is a professor in computer science at the Technion. She's a member of Academia Europea and an ACM fellow. She holds a PhD in computer science at Technion and an honorary doctorate from the Technical University of Munich. Uh, her research interests include automated verification of software and hardware, automated program repair, uh, exploiting model checking to find security vulnerabilities, abstraction, refinement and modularity in model checking, temporal logics and automata on infinite objects. She's a co-author of Model Checking, a main reference book in the field of formal verification. And her work on counterexample guided abstraction refinement has won the uh, award from the International Conference on Computer-Aided Verification. And today we're delighted to have her presenting a talk entitled Automated Program Repair Using Formal Verification Techniques. Welcome, Orna. Hello, thank you for the introduction, Peter. So um, I will be talking about automated program repair using formal verification technique. Uh, this is based on, just a moment, it's not moving. Uh, this is based on, um, uh, on, on joint work with uh, Hadar uh, Frankel, Batren Rottenberg, uh, Corina Passareno, and Sarai uh, Sheinwald. Uh, it consists of two different works that uh, I will describe uh, separately. So in general, one of the building block that uh, we count on is model checking, uh, which is the tool for uh, verification. And um, uh, model checking uh, receives uh, a system, uh, a model of the system and specification, and it checks whether the system satisfies the specification and it answers both yes if the system does satisfy the specification and no plus counter example uh, otherwise and the counter example is very useful especially when our goal is to repair a program in uh, we will focus on formal automated program repair where model checking will find a bug in the program and bug will be a program run that violates the specification and the repair tool will automatically suggest a repairs one or more uh, where a repair is a change to the program co a code that result in a correct program. Automated program repair um, it's a very active uh, research area, and most of the works are actually test-based uh, test and not uh, formal verification-based. In test-based, we are given a set of buggy uh, tests and a set of correct tests, and uh, we suggest a repair that will uh, correct the buggy test and will preserve the correctness of the correct one. Uh, in contrast, in formal verification technique, we have a program and a specification, and we suggest a repair so that the repaired program satisfies the specification. So the first work that I'm going to describe focuses on the notion of must fault localization, which goes hand in hand with program repair. Assume that uh, in general, in program repair, we are given a buggy program. Uh, we are um, uh, taking the program through some, um, some uh, procedure, repair procedure, and we result in a patched program 
that is correct. Well, the patch, as said, is some changes uh, to the program tech, uh, to the program code. So for fault localization, assume that we are given a buggy program with a violating run. A fault localization will identify locations in the run that uh, might be um, relevant for the bug. And now we can, uh, we can choose one or more of this uh, location and change them and as a result may uh, find a correct program. So uh, fault localization uh, is uh, uh, actually the goal of fault localization is to uh, focus the programmer's attention on locations that might be relevant to the bug. And it's important to have good fault localization because uh, if a, a fault localization is too restrictive, then we might miss a potential repair and if it is too permissive, then it may cause extra search work. Uh, often fault localizations are type of may fault localization, where there is no guarantee that all returned locations are relevant, nor that every relevant location is returned. We are going to suggest a novel notion of must fault localization. Uh, it turns out that when uh, defining must fault localization, we need to consider the repair scheme, where a repair scheme actually identifies the changes that are allowed uh, to program uh, changes, uh, a statement while doing the repair. Uh, for instance, uh, the program scheme that we uh, will uh, relate to in this uh, talk uh, will be a, a program scheme called S-Mute for mutation, and it allows syntactic replacement of operators uh, in the right-hand side of assignment and conditions. So for example, we may uh, replace a plus by a minus or a greater than uh, with a, a smaller than or a constant with a, con a constant plus one. The must false localization then is a set of locations that contains at least one location from each, uh, from any successful repair to the bug. This means that it is impossible to fix the bug using only locations outside of this set, or in other words, any repair for the, this specific bug must use at least one location from this set. Um, must, uh, must notion, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned before, must notion depends on the chosen repair scheme and uh, uh, we, um, uh, we match our uh, must uh, uh, fault localization to S-mute. Actually, it also uh, preserved the uh, uh, SR, but I will not get into this. So our setting, since we are doing formal automated program repair, we have a specification and the uh, program is supposed to satisfy the specification for all input. However, we will restrict ourselves to a um, verification which is bounded. This is very common for in uh, a program verification. Uh, where bounded means that we just guarantee that every run of the program uh, up to a certain bound will not violate uh, the assertion. Uh, the uh, program repair that we use is search-based. Uh, we just have the search space are all possible patch programs, and we generate in, uh, one program at a time, and we validate whether it's correct or not. The validation usually is done by means of SMT or uh, SAT solvers. So we just generate one program, and if it's true, if it's correct, then it is um, going to the user, and otherwise it is, it is just thrown away. Uh, I will explain the algorithm for must fault localization by example. So let's have a, a simple program. You don't have to 
uh, try to understand what uh, this program does because it does nothing interesting, uh, but it has a bug. And the bug, uh, having a bug means that it just violate one of the assertion in the code. So let's see an example of a bug. We start with an input uh, of uh, in which x is zero and w is zero. And uh, now t becomes zero and y becomes minus three. Z becomes plus three. And uh, when we get to the condition, we see that w is not greater than three because w is zero. So the if is not taken and rather the assertion is reached. And now we check the assertion, y is minus three and z is three, uh, which uh, violate the assertion, which requires that y will be greater than z. So this is a violating run of the program. And the first thing that we do is to transform the program into a set of constraints. So uh, this is done, the set of constraints is in the form of static single, uh, single static assignment, SSA. And uh, the way it is done is just to uh, attach with every occurrence of the variable, a new index variable. So for instance, here we assign y, uh, y with, with the value x minus three. So here this assignment uh, transform into a constraint that uh, uh, state that y zero equals x zero minus three. The next time we assign to y, um, sorry, the next time y is assigned, y get the value of y plus 10, then we have y one, this is the second occurrence of y, uh, which is equal to y zero plus 10. Um, and uh, to the set of constraints, oh, we have another point. Uh, the conditions in the if are assigned to a Boolean variable. And now if we want to know at this point, which value y received, we have a y tree. This is another occurrence of y, which is uh, if g zero holds, then uh, we take the value of y1 uh, and otherwise y0, which means actually that we check the condition of the if, and if this condition holds, then we take the value of y1, and otherwise we take the value of y0. And now we add to this set of constraints the negation of the assertions, if we have several assertions, this is the negation of their uh, conjunction or negation of each one and disjunct, uh, disjunct all, uh, them all. Uh, this means that if we find a satisfying assignment to this set of constraints, then this actually uh, represents a behavior of the program that violates the assertion, uh, meaning a buggy uh, behavior. So uh, here we have a buggy behavior um, represented by, um, by means of the indexed variables. And now we want to compute the set of locations that are responsible for this bug. So the first thing that we do is to have a dependency graph, a static dependency graph that uh, has uh, the indexed variables as nodes, and we have an edge between y2 and y0 if y0, y2 depends on y0, and we see that y2 depends on y0 if g0 uh, is false. This comes from this, from here. y2 gets the value of y0 when g0 is false. Other, it also depends on y1 and depends on g0 and so on. Uh, now when we uh, want to, uh, to compute the fault localization, we are interested in specific bug. So in that case, we have another 
uh, another graph in which we only take the dependencies that correspond to the specific assignment that we have. So in, uh, in particular, this assignment um, satisfies not G zero, and therefore we only choose um, y, y zero and G zero as influencing Y two. Once we have this dynamic dependency graph, then we can, we can compute the slice for y2 and the slice for z, uh, z0. The, the reason that we take the slice for these two is that the, this assertion is violated and um, this assertion uses the y2 and z, uh, z0. Uh, these are the, um, the constraints that influence the value of y2 and the zero according to the dynamic graph. And finally, the mass fault localization set is the actual statement from the program that correspond to this one. So this is the mass fault localization set that we obtain. Uh, when we implemented the mass fault localization, we implemented it within a repair tool called uh, all repair, which is based on generate and validate and returns all minimal repairs from the search space base, based on S mute. And the minimality is with respect to the number of changes and uh, number of mutations uh, applied to the code. So let's uh, um, look again at this picture. What happens here is that once we generate um, a patch program, we check it, and if it's correct, then not only we eliminate from the search space this particular program, but we also eliminate other programs in which the patch is larger, is a superset of the, uh, the actual um, patch that was used here. In this way, we just pruned some of the search space with, which helps um, in making the uh, algorithm uh, more efficient because the heavy part is going over the search space one by one and checking each one whether it's, it is validate or not. So now we want to improve it. And uh, so we already have some pruning when a correct mutated program is generated, but we also want to uh, have pruning of the search space when uh, the buggy, a buggy mutated program is generated. And here what we will do, we will eliminate similar buggy mutated program. And here we are going to use the fault localization idea. So when we are uh, when we are having an unsuccessful repair, then uh, we obtain a mutated program which is buggy, and now we want to eliminate all the uh, all other programs that have the same set of uh, uh, or, sorry, uh, we identify the mass uh, location set for this program and we just eliminate all the uh, program that have the same statement as this uh, PM. So if uh, uh, another program share, uh, is, um, share the same set of uh, mass location set, then it will contain exactly the same bug. And therefore we can uh, prune it from the search space uh, without even checking it. And this saves a lot of uh, efforts. So what we do right now, we take, we, again, we generate the program. And if it is incorrect, then not only we prune it from the search space, but also all others that share the same fault localization set. And as before, if it's correct, then we prune all programs that uh, are a superset of changes. 
uh, we have a theorem um, that says that actually when we add false localization to all repair, we result in a sound a complete algorithm, which means that no good repair is eliminated by our pruning uh, of the search space. Uh, we had uh, um, we compared all repair with and without fault localization, and uh, what is interesting is the um, instances uh, which took the most amount of time. And here, each dot here is a different instance. The red are um, uh, represent the time it took with the fault localization, and the blue. Uh, without, and we see that uh, with the false localization, we have a great improvement, a great speed up. We even have some uh, cases where the uh, all repair was timed out, where fault, local, uh, fault localization, all repair uh, returned uh, result. So just to summarize, we suggested a novel notion of must fault localization, uh, with respect, which depends on the uh, specific repair scheme that we use. It's must and not may, meaning that we must change at least one of the suggested uh, statement. And uh, we uh, show that uh, this uh, notion uh, obtain, uh, with this notion, we obtained a significant pruning of the cell space for all repair without losing any good potential repair. So now I want to move to another um, notion of repair, which is quite different. Uh, it uh, uses a assume guarantee, which is verification scheme, uh, a widely used verification scheme. Uh, and if this scheme um, fails to verify the program and found the counterexample, then we suggest a repair. Uh, the goal here is to exploit the partition of the system into components and use compositional model checking to verify small components and to conclude the correctness of the full system. And if a bug is found, to repair it um, to apply repair to one of the components. So our setting now is C-like communicating systems and a safety specification given as an automaton. So here is a program. The program is quite simple. It reads a password uh, from some uh, input uh, uh, channel and as long as the password is too short, it has, has less than three digits, then it reads another pos uh, password and so on until it obtains a password which is long enough. Once it does it, it sends it for encryption. Um, the, uh, the password, the result, the encrypted password is uh, assigned uh, to pass two. So this is the way we describe this program. And uh, this is actually the control flow graph of the program. And the reason we choose to describe it this way is that this is very similar to automaton and we want to use automata learning algorithms. So here you see that um, we read uh, some uh, input. This is the question mark. We read the value of x from the input. We check whether it's um, smaller, it, uh, smaller than 999 and uh, read again and so on. Um, the, when the uh, password is long enough, we send it to encryption. The sending is with exclamation mark. And then we wait for the other component to send us an encrypted password via the uh, channel get encrypted. When we have several components in the system, they synchronize on, the common, um, on their common channel. 
So here we see that they share uh, encrypt and get encrypt, the two components share these channels, but the channel in is actually in a, a channel that uh, comes from the environment of this uh, component, it's just an input, and therefore there is no synchronization here. So uh, the first component, and actually it's M2 later on, uh, it just reads the password, then it checks uh, whether it's long enough as much as needed, and when it's long enough, then it synchronizes with the other uh, component uh, and it sends it its value. The other component then uh, encrypt the value where the encryption is uh, just multiplied by two, is not very deep encryption, but uh, it's simple. And then it sends it back to the uh, first component through the channel uh, get encrypt. The kind of the of specification we are going to use is again um, described as an automaton. Uh, here the alphabet is the uh, communications. So we may describe that we always want first to read at least one occurrence of the uh, of a password from the input, and only then synchronize on the encoding. So this is syntactic uh, requirement that actually uh, describe what sequences of communications are allowed. In addition, we also have syntactic, uh, semantic requirements, which are expressed using constraints over local variables of the two components. So for instance, we may require that the, ent the entered password is different from the encrypted password. This is uh, described by requiring that X1, this is the input at the beginning, is different from X2, which is the value obtained from the encrypt, uh, encryption. Another um, requirement, which is semantic, uh, might be that there is no overflow. So uh, here we require that X2 after encryption is smaller than two to the 64. Since we are going to apply verification, we will need also an error state and the error state is, is such that transitions are sent to it when uh, the, the constraints are not uh, satisfied. So for instance, here we require that uh, the password will be different than the encrypted password. And if they are equal, they go to error. And the same here, if we require that um, the encryption is smaller than two to the 64, then if it's greater or equal to two to the 64, then we send uh, the behavior to, uh, to the error state. So now we want to exploit the assume guarantee framework, which is commonly used for uh, compositional verification. So what we have here, uh, we, ha we have two components, M1 and M2, and we want to verify that they, satisfies, uh, they satisfy P. So the first thing we do, we take M1 and we check it in, uh, together with A, which is some assum assumption on the behavior of the environment of M1. So we check whether M1 uh, composed with this uh, assumption on the environment satisfies P. Next, we check whether this assumption uh, faithfully describe M2. This is the other part. And if both premises hold, then we can conclude that M1 composed with M2 satisfies P. So uh, this is the way assume guarantee is usually done. It has a component of learning. 
and the learning just learn the uh, assumption on the environment. We then check here the premises of the loop, of the rule. And if the premises hold, then we can uh, return a positive uh, result. We can say that indeed P holds in M1 composed with M2. If um, uh, in this case where M, uh, AI composed with M1 does not satisfy P, then uh, the conclusion is that we need to strengthen AI to eliminate some behaviors from AI. And here we need to weaken the assumptions. On the other hand, if we find a counterexample and we see that it's real, then we can conclude that M1 composed with M2 is indeed violated. And what we did in addition to adapting this framework to our setting is to add a component of repair. So if we get a violation of P in M1 composed with M2, then we repair M2 and we check again whether M, uh, M1 composed with uh, the repaired M2 uh, satisfy the, uh, the required property. So let's see how uh, we do it for our setting. Uh, L star in general is an algorithm for learning an unknown language L by iterative interaction between a learner and a teacher, which is an oracle that we have to implement and actually um, say how it should answer the, the specific questions from the learner. And the learner has two kinds of uh, questions. It asks membership queries, which is, uh, is a certain word uh, in the language, the unknown language L. And at some point, the learner has some conjecture of how an automaton for this language L should look like. And then it asks an equivalent queries, uh, which is whether this, the language of the, um, the conjecture A uh, equals L. Um, L star is uh, guaranteed to uh, terminate and work well uh, when the unknown language is uh, regular, it's regular language, and it is over a finite alphabet. Unfortunately, in our setting, we have infinite state programs with first order constraints, which is not necessarily uh, regular if we uh, are not careful. So the first thing that we need to do is to make the alphabet finite. And we do it by learning a uh, alphabet on statements or in the code. So actually we learn words over assignment, communication, action, and constraint. This is actually a symbolic representation of the uh, of our components. In addition, since we need uh, some uh, to learn some uh, some language which is uh, regular, we choose to, le to learn the set of words in M2, which are sequences of statement. And it is regular because M2 is an automaton. So we actually manage to find a regular language over finite alphabet, and uh, therefore we can apply L star. But now the learner uh, can raise the question, but I already know M2, why should I learn it? And the answer here is that we might find a much smaller assumption for the rule. So we are actually the goal of applying L, uh, the L star, is to find an assumption for the rule, for the assumed guarantee rule. And we may find uh, an assumption which will be much smaller than the M2 we are trying to learn. So here is how the interaction between the learner and the teacher goes. First of all, there are the membership queries. So the learner asks, is W in the language L, the unknown language L. And what the teacher does 
it checks whether this word, this word is in the sequence of uh, is a word in M2, but here we actually check the sequence of a statement in M2. And if it is not, then we just say no, this word is not, because we are trying to learn the set of words of M2. On the other hand, if we find that uh, W is in T of um, M2, then we, ch we check whether this word composed with M1 satisfies P. And if yes, uh, if it does, then we return yes, because we are looking for all the word in M2 that together with M1 satisfies P. Uh, if on the other hand, W is in M2, but together with M1 does not satisfy P, then we actually found the real counterexample and we can stop the whole process because we know that M1 composed with M2 uh, will not satisfy P. Here we got uh, an evidence for that. So now let's go to the equivalence query. Uh, the learner already come out with some conjecture, uh, some automaton that he think will uh, indeed play uh, plays well uh, in the uh, assume guarantee rule. So he asked the teacher whether uh, the language of uh, his conjecture uh, equals L. And now the, what the uh, teacher does is first checking whether this uh, conjecture AI together with M1 satisfies P. And if it does, then it checks whether M2 is a subset of AI. And if this is actually sa to say that M2 satisfies AI, and if these two holds, then the premises uh, of the rule hold, and we conclude that M1 composed with M2 um, satisfies P, and we can stop. Uh, we see that we didn't, uh, we didn't really learn M2, but we learn enough to make the compositional rule uh, ver um, work and verify our uh, problem of whether M1 composed with M2 satisfies P. Another possibility is that M1 composed with AI does not satisfy P. And then we get a counterexample, which is a run of AI that together with M1 does not satisfy P. And then we check whether this run is in M2. And if it does, then we get a real counterexample. And then we can stop the process because we actually found that M1 composed with M2 does not satisfy P. And we can uh, go to the repair part. Um, on the other hand, if T is not in, in M2, then uh, we return, the teacher returns no, and we need to remove T from AI uh, when we construct the next, um, the next conjecture. Another possibility is that we get that M2 is not included in M1, and now uh, we need to add um, um, to add T uh, to a I plus one. So here is the general framework. Uh, we have this uh, learning. We have the, we check the premises of the rule. And then we can either, um, we can either conclude that M1 composed with M2 satisfies P or that M1 composed with M2 does not satisfy P. And in the second case, we just uh, apply repair and we go back to learning. But here we, uh, we check whether M1 composed with the repair M2 uh, satisfies P. And an important uh, point is that the process is incremental. 
the new application of L starts uh, start from the result of the previous application of L star because all the answers that were given before by the teacher for M2 are still relevant for the repaired M2. And this saves a lot of effort. So now let's uh, uh, consider the repair. What do we do there? So we have two kinds of uh, counterexamples that we want to get rid of. One is a synt a syntactic repair and the other is semantic repair. And let's start from the semantic repair in which, in which the counterexample contains a, a violating constraint. So for instance, here we have a counterexample that actually reach here with an overflow. So what we do, we look for a new constraint uh, and uh, the counterexample is a specific one for input in which x1 is 2 to the 62, 63. So we now want to find a new a constraint that will make the formula, the set of constraints describing, describing t infeasible. So we want to change the, uh, the program in a way that this particular counterexample will not be feasible anymore. It will not be a behavior, a legal behavior of the program. For that, we use abduction and uh, using abduction, quantifier elimination and simplification, all with the help of Z3, we uh, get the result that the constraint we are looking for is to require that initially X1 is smaller than two to the 63. And now we can update our uh, M2 and add this uh, additional constraint. And we can also think of adding it to the actual program. Another type of repairs it, are syntactic. Uh, this happens when the counterexample contains no constraints and then abduction cannot be of help. It just say that we have a sequence of uh, assignment and uh, communications that are illegal, illegal in the program. And then what we do is just remove syntactically the counter example. And uh, we have three um, levels of removing counter examples. Uh, one is the exact when the counter exactly this counter example is removed from M2. This is uh, the most exact, it might be um, the most uh, uh, slow one because we just eliminate the counter examples one by one. We may apply approxim approximate uh, removal or aggressive removal and I will not go into the details. So uh, an in, uh, interesting point is the correctness and termination of, the, uh, of our framework. It turns out that in case M1 composed with M2 satisfies P, then uh, we are guaranteed to be able to prove it uh, and terminate using the L star. On the other hand, when M1 composed with M2 uh, does not satisfy P, then uh, the repair may add more constraints, which means that we extend the alphabet. And in this case, um, we are guaranteed to uh, that the proce uh, process uh, will progress, but we are not guaranteed to have termination because we may eliminate counterexamples one by one, and there are, might be um, infinitely many of those. So here we, uh, we are guaranteed to have a progress in the uh, process to eliminate more and more counterexamples, but we may not terminate, which is not surprising because our setting is of uh, a, an infinite state system with constraints, with uh, variables over uh, infinite domains. So it's not uh, surprising that we may not terminate. So just to, uh, to summarize, 
uh, we presented uh, a learning-based assume guarantee algorithm for infinite uh, state communicated, uh, communicating program, and we had to adjust L star for handling infinite state system. Uh, the application of L star are incremental, and uh, in general, our experimental results show that uh, we obtain quite small assumption by the learning process. And we add a repair, which is both semantic and syntactic. So to summarize the whole, pro the whole uh, lecture, we had two approaches which are quite different, both involve verification and uh, repair, and they are based on formal uh, method technology. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Warner. Uh, are there questions? So um, if you're in, in here as an attendee, you can post questions in the Q&A uh, using the Q&A feature on Zoom. If you're a panelist, um, feel free just to turn your video on and speak up. Uh, hi, Orna. Uh, here is uh, Raz Boric. This was a very nice talk. Thank you. Can you clarify for us, I'm sure you mentioned it, how do you ensure that you don't remove behaviors that are desired, meaning you repair to satisfy safety, but mm -hmm. is it possible that you remove behaviors that we desire to have? Uh, actually, yes. So uh, the program, uh, the uh, specification does not require certain uh, behavior to exist. Uh, we don't have uh, an existential behavior, so it's just a set of behaviors that uh, must, uh, that are legal and uh, the system uh, need to conform with those. Um, and we may remove uh, too much. Actually, in uh, certain cases where we use the aggressive uh, syntactic uh, repair, then we ended up in a, an empty um, a component, which uh, theoretically is correct, but of course this is not what we aim at. So we don't have a, a, a meaning to avoid removing, um, removing behavior that are desired because the specification doesn't give indication an indication of which behaviors are desired, must stay there. So maybe we need to consider a specification that insists on some behavior to be there and then they cannot be removed. So at least a set of test cases perhaps, right? Okay, this is another uh, possibility that we consider to uh, combine test-based uh, approach with the formal approach. Just to get a lower bound on the behaviors that you preserve. Um, right. Okay. Uh, thank you. One one question about the first part of the talk: Is there a connection between unsatisfiable core in set formulas and the must locations that you identify? Uh, not necessarily. Um... When we compute it, as you saw, we are not using uh, um, answered core. This is what you were asking about. I, I understand that it's not what you did, but I wonder whether there is a connection in the sense that you could perhaps phrase it as such and then obtain those statements as unsatisfiable core of a constraint mm -hmm. system. So other uh, works, uh, at, uh, there is at least one work, I don't remember now uh, the name, uh, that use uh, answered core. And I think that the problem with uh, most of other approach is that in, uh, in a sense, they will ignore the conditions in the program. They, uh, and sometimes the condition is the reason for the bug. If you, change the, the condition itself, then you will correct the bug. And uh, many of the other approach for false localization just ignore the conditions, especially uh, like in our case, where 
the execution didn't get into the if statement at all because the condition was false. So, uh, so in that case, uh, most of the works that we uh, examined uh, do not produce a must for localization, but a may. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. So I want to have a question about the second part of the talk, the learning based assume uh, guarantee algorithm. So it's it's using automata learning approaches to to find find counter examples um, in in these sort of settings where you have a lot of, the, of, of related. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it uses uh, the learning to find an assumption for the assume guarantee rule. Right. Right to to you know with the aim of of identifying these kind of examples, right? I mean, this is this is kind of one output from this process. Um, okay, yeah, actually, okay. What's the? I'm question? sorry, maybe I maybe I've misunderstood. So actually, the learning uh, the uh, traditional uh, use of learning in assume guarantee uh, tries to find all the behaviors that together with M1 will satisfy the program. This is the target. Right, right. So it's, it's identifying that, um, that language. In, in many of these um, settings uh, where you're, you're solving a lot of related learning problems, the, um, uh, I, I guess here you can get by without, without um, uh, actually solving, uh, identifying this, this language. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so the order in which you uh, approach the truth is very important, um, you know, in the sense of how rapidly that process proceeds. Mm -hmm. um, in, in lots of uh, different, different formal uh, settings for the learning problems, but related learning problems, there are, there are these uh, transfer learning approaches that aim to use you know, a, a collection of related learning tasks and exploit commonalities between them to, to speed up the, the process. Um, you know, it seems like um, uh, that could be something very useful to, to shape the inductive bias of this process in, in, in the setting that you, you have here. Is there any prospect of using those approaches here or is this something you... Uh, I don't know uh, which uh, work, can you tell me again? Which work um, is I'm, it? I mean, there's a broad area. It, it, I, I haven't seen it in, you know, when you're working with, with membership and equivalence queries for, for these kinds of problems. But for um, learning from examples, there's this broad area of, of mm -hmm. transfer learning where you, you have a number of related problems. Maybe, maybe there are uh, somehow related computer vision problems, um, you know, and you can hope to exploit commonalities across those problems mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, for, for any new task to learn that faster. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting then, idea. We can try and see if it's useful in this uh, uh, in this context. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. If there are no other questions, um, please join me in in thanking Orna um, for a wonderful talk. That was uh, very interesting. Give us a lot to think about. Thanks, Orna. Thanks. Thank you.